Hi, everyone. We're going to get started today. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Lori Lilly, and I'm the founder and executive director of Howard EcoWorks, um, as well as your host this evening for our webinar, The Environment and Our Health, with our guest speaker, Dr. Vita Manny. For this evening's web webinar, please log your questions in the Q&A box, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. We will be recording this webinar and posting it to our website within a week, so keep a lookout there if you'd like to revisit any of the content. Dr. Manny has also agreed to share her slides, so we will distribute those um, afterwards for your future reference. I just have three slides here to introduce you to our organization and announce a new pilot program that we are running in a few weeks. Howard EcoWorks' mission is to empower communities and diverse workforces to respect and restore our natural systems for future generations. So this is a dual mission for both workforce development programming and environmental improvements. We are still a pretty new organization just formed in 2016, and the services that we offer largely revolve around designing, building, and maintaining different types of environmental projects. Our flagship is the READY program, Restoring the Environment and Developing Youth, shown in the picture in the bottom, and that's for young adults aged 16 to 25. We also have a nine-month program called Uplift, where we work to place our participants into permanent environmental jobs. And lastly, we run a program called Seeds of Change out of our local detention center, where we operate a native plant nursery and grow plants for our projects. In all of our programs, we are looking to marry environmental restoration with the social benefits of workforce training. In this time of the coronavirus, we believe that it is even more meaningful to explore and advocate for green jobs in similar, a similar vein as FDR did with the Chesapeake Con or the Civilian Conservation Corps after the Great Depression. We have plenty of work to do and deferred maintenance to catch up on that would not only help our environment and natural resources, but can provide work opportunities that lend themselves much more readily to social distancing by being outside in fresh air. For young displaced workers, this can be a particularly viable transition opportunity for on either a temporary or a permanent basis. To that end, we're offering a paid 30 hour training opportunity called Gateway to Green Jobs from November 30th to December 4th for individuals displaced from their jobs due to the coronavirus. This is a great chance to explore meaningful work opportunities in the environmental field. Individuals will leave the training with exposure to the industry and a wide variety of employers, plus a sustainable landscaping certificate. Applications are due November 17th and can be found on our website, howardecoworks.org. Now for our featured speaker, Dr. Manny is an emergency med medicine physician now practicing for 16 years with a strong personal interest in environmental health. Her mission is to bring environmental issues to the forefront of the medical field. She aims to incorporate environmental issues into clinical practice as she believes that the health of the environment is a surrogate measure of our society's overall health and well being. She is an active member of her local environmental advisory committee and the mother of two outdoor enthusiasts. So with that, I'm going to hand the screen sharing over to Dr. Manny and let her do her thing. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. And I just want to say I feel very honored um, to be presenting to everyone tonight. And I really uh, appreciate the time you're spending on the screen here. And um, so with that, let me just um, jump into sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, okay, so I guess unless I hear from someone, everyone can see my screen here. So um, my um, title of my uh, presentation is called Environment and Our Health. And particularly mo most of what I'm going to talk about with hitting the different disease, disease processes that we see in just being your regular doctor and working in the community around here. Um, uh, how, what I do every day with patients does tie in with how we use our land and um, how um, habitat conservation um, does play into our, our 
clinical practices uh, if we really sit down and think about it. So um, I'm coming to you to present as a, a mother of two young children, physician and a biophiliac, which is just a, a, a lover of all, all living things. So humans, plants, animals, everything encompassing. So I'm gonna start out, um, you're gonna sort of get a little uh, taste of what it's like to be at um, you know, medical presentation where we um, share patient, we usually start out with patient presentations um, to be able to communicate with each other. So um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to present these different patients that I, I have ac actually seen in practice um, and tie in um, how our current uh, environmental issues um, play into these, you know, run-of-the-mill patient presentations. Um, so with each of these, I'm going to go and um, we're going to talk about each of them one by one as I, as I go through. Um, but before I, I do this, I know I just wanted to touch on that when we all talk about the environment and climate change, and it, it seems very um, uh, dis dystopian and, um, you know, is, are we at the point of no return? But um, I do want to come in with this on a positive note that it's, all, it's not all just dire and, and dismal, that um, I'm seeing this as the glass is, is half full or to put it, um, the meadow is half mowed, um, that, that we don't have to accept that this poor environmental health is just a consequence of you know, being a modernized society, that we can um, think of solutions that can um, give us access to our um, modern way of living and also um, think about conserving the environment um, and, uh, and habitat, local habitats. Uh, so it's think globally, act locally, because just to make kind of a little joke of it, you, you, you need more than just an apple to keep someone like me, the, the doctor, away. Um, and just to clarify before I jump in, what do I mean by land and habitat conservation? Um, I'm basically just, my, I really just mean that we're protecting our natural lands and returning them to sort of their, their natural state as they evolved. Now, I don't, I'm not, that's not where my expertise is, and that's where I would say to defer to the experts, such as Howard Eker works. Obviously, uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach where we have to converge ecologists, botanists, microbiologists, zoologists, that's so many disciplines to figure out how to do that. But obviously, that is not that that is not my area of expertise. And um, but I just wanted to to just introduce that this is what um, my definition is when I talk about land and habitat conservation. So first, I'm going to touch on stormwater runoff um, and how I came about to sort of discover what stormwater runoff is and how it I how it affects me in my clinical practice is that I may see. Uh, 56 year old female with recurrent sinusitis and chronic cough. You know, this chronic sinusitis back in the office for different antibiotics, can't cure it. Um, or, you know, these multiple patients that have this sort of chronic diarrhea and uh, we're, we're not sure um, what's causing it. Um, so, also just to start out, what is stormwater runoff? I'm sure I'm. People in the audience can probably tell me more what it is, but just to um, define it is that um, it's with these storms, um, with the runoff volume uh, that increases with the increase in impervious, impervious surface area. So the more um, driveways, roofs, parking lots we have, um, it has more impervious surface and the sort of the water from the rain has nowhere to go. And um, we see that as we have more and more development, it increases to annual runoff volumes. Something that, you know, someone from my background in medicine, I don't, not, not knowing much about ecology is that, you know, I, I really didn't know that large lawns can also generate up to 90% um, as much runoff. You would think the, a, a large typical suburban lawn may absorb all that rain, but in, in fact, it, it doesn't. Um, and even these uh, large agricultural land uses do also contribute to a lot of the, the, the runoff. 
And so, you know, you think about, well, where did these, this idea of the large lawns come from? And, um, you know, when I go back, it's sort of this post-World War II conformity idea of the, the suburban dream. Um, and, you know, why we vilified dandelions, you know, where did that all come from? Because in fact, you come to realize dandelions are actually great for your lawns and keeping the, the soil intact with its deep roots. Um, and la lawns are not, you know, are not a natural state of habitat, uh, that, that nature actually toward, tends, trends towards diversity, not uniformity. And then, um, just to touch quickly on other things that lawns bring in, it's uh, this biotic homogenization. We get rid of, you know, the diversity in different habitats and then the synthetic chemicals and mowing your lawn and the soil erosion, all that stuff is happening too, but that, I'm not gonna get into that. What I'm gonna get into more is that on our own properties, so bringing it to our own um, experiences on our own properties that if we have these lawns and and the roads and paved um, driveways that we are creating impervious surface that will create runoff that goes into our houses and dwellings and this can be anywhere else to rural suburban urban um, and once water finds its way into your house um, you've created this indoor mold problem and it's um, this water intrusion event with drying periods that create spores and these spores can go all, all over your house. You know, the idea that mold could, could contribute to chronic sinusitis was sort of um, not accepted um, some time ago, but more recently is, it is being accepted in, in you know, our conventional medical circles that it, it can contribute as an allergen to a lot of these respiratory issues that we see in the office. Um, and um, it actually makes our, our job as, as providers difficult to diagnose because it's really hard to treat once it it's becomes a chronic sinusitis. So in addition with stormwater runoff, um, uh, come to find that it, as, as we see that there's increases in, in stormwater runoff, um, that it may have some association with these waterborne illnesses that we see and you know these diarrheal illnesses that are becoming more and more common um, because what happens is that um, you know there, there, may, there are two different ways if you have your own well system versus public water um, that are these large storms that overwhelm the system, system um, it increases, um, increases contamination, contamination. Um, and, um, and, and counterintuitively, these big, big, big rains, rains um, um, they don't, they don't actually dilute the toxins and pathogens. Um, they, they more overwhelm the systems we have to, to sterilize. And also with the storm water, they bring a lot of the um, sediments that also contributes and um, decreases uh, how effective our ways of treating the water are. And more you know, one study says that about 20 million Americans get sick um, every year from contamination of the water from parasites and, and bacteria. Um, so they've done some uh, multiple studies where they're measuring these large storms or large areas of runoff and find that in the water, different water sources, that there are increased concentrations of these different types of um, bacteria. Um, one, cryptosporidium, which I do see, um, you know, cryptosporidium is, is a type of parasite that usually causes problems in people who are immunocompromised um, that um, don't have a good immune system. But sometimes we see a pop up in someone who has uh, some kind of GI issues and they're, they don't have any health issues. And you wonder, we're told that that's not really a source of their GI, it could be just an incidental finding. But when you see it kind of more and more pop up, you start wondering, um, why is this popping up in my, in my clinical practice? And more and more, even despite the fact that we treat with chlorine and do these fancy filtrations, that they're still entering our water source. And, um, and actually maybe having some indication in some studies that um, they're becoming kind of resistant to, to chlorine. So again, you know, these um, large stormwater runoff um, events are introducing more of these pathogens in our, in our water sources. 
So just to wrap up um, with storm water runoff, um, the idea is that, you know, if we kind of think about our land use, whether it's in your township or bigger area or just on your own property, um, where you can, if you address kind of the, the storm runoff that's happening on your property, um, decrease the chance that water gets in your house, you um, may be helping, you know, the, your exposure to mold in your house and thinking about your water supply. And also, if, if not even those two things that, um, you know, you, you would help the erosion that may be happening on your soil that, um, well, that you need to support um, these natural habitats which I'm going to get into um, on the next topic. Um, so um, this is sort of the hot topic now, these uh, zoonotic diseases um, with uh, COVID being our um, one in the spotlight. So just to, um, to define what uh, zoonotic diseases um, are is that it's a, it's a disease that is transmitted by animals um, and you kind of need uh, something in between. A vec we call them vectors, which can be ticks or mosquitoes, um, and, uh, or it can be transmitted through, the disease can be transmitted through urine or feces of, of an animal. But more and more um, in the last uh, several uh, decades that these new diseases that are appearing are, are zoonotic in their origin. And um, there's a lot of us that are thinking that that's happening because of um, the, the, the human activity on natural habitats that are allowing this to happen. Because what happens is um, once animals ha don't have their natural habitats, um, they are forced into these environments that are created by us, anthropogenic. Um, and sort of interacting with other animals and humans where before by evolution, they were all sort of separated into, separated nicely because they evolved through thousands of years that way. It's also, when we talk about habitat destruction, we're not talking necessarily, we're talking about reduction in the number of species, but also we are compromising the diversity of animal species and which generally, creates a situation of survival of the fittest and then you're sort of favoring these generalist species that can survive sort of what um, on different types of uh, habitats but these general species are probably better hosts for a lot of these diseases incidentally as well and you know I sometimes I hesitate to talk about you know how all oh, the, the disease that animals and insects bring and it's it's not to instill fear of the wild but more to recognize that it is our activities that are sort of making something that was oh something always there more controlled happening more so first I'm going to touch on um, Lyme disease and um, this is a, a very big um, has a high incidence in, in our area. So I'm, I'm actually from, I should have said, I'm, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, um, but we're all sort of on the, on the East Coast here. And I know Lyme disease is a big um, uh, uh, deal in, in, you know, nationally. And um, I had my own experience with Lyme disease um, just recently with my own son coming downstairs one day with this big, huge, um, swollen, boggy knee. And that is a, actually a classic presentation of Lyme disease in children. Um, so Lyme disease, um, this is a disease that is transmitted by a tick. The name of the, it's a bacteria, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. And um, so how, how it works is, um, you know, there, there's ticks that carry the bacteria. And um, the ticks, by nature of how they um, feed each cycle through their life, they need to feed on a type of animal. And we're gonna call those animals hosts. There's different types of hosts that they have. Um, they, um, but for our purposes, just to um, break it down to make it simple, is that there's hosts, we call them reservoir hosts, um, where they, um, if you see on the left there, the, the birds and the mice, they, these are the hosts that carry the disease, to carry the bacteria. 
Then we have here um, where you see the bigger animals, the, the deer and the cattle, these non-reservoir hosts where the tick will feed on them, but these are non-reservoir, I mean, they don't carry the, the, Lyme, the Lyme disease bacteria. And then we have us there on the, on the right there that we're the, the end, um, end of the line for the ticks where um, um, we, we are sort of dead end hosts, we call it. So the reason why it's important to differentiate these is because you can have a, a tick that's born with, and the tick is born without Lyme disease. And if it decides to feed on a, the, a mice, on a mouse, that mouse will have be carrying Lyme disease. So now the tick has acquired Lyme disease by feeding on the, the mouse. Um, then so this, this tick can then decide to feed on a deer, um, but it, it, the deer has an ability to fight off the Lyme disease, so it's not going to carry it so it can infect another tick. So it's this back, So then if you have an infected tick and then it decides to feed on a mouse that may not have Lyme disease, now the, the tick gives the mice Lyme disease. So it's this sort of relationship back and forth with a tick and a mouse, um, mice that are, are kind of exchanging the bacteria, but now the tick is able to take that bacteria to um, other types of hosts. Now, since a tick um, is, had, takes several years for a tick to hang around, it has plenty of time to kind of go from different hosts. And um, also the, 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 in, the, the tick survival is based on other um, elements in the environment, um, needing a, a specific percentage of hum, um, humidity, um, but that and climate change and other factors may play into that, but that's not something I'm really gonna get, get into it. But um, once it gets the bacteria, um, it has it through all its life cycles. So around here um, on the East Coast, uh, criminal number one is this white-footed mouse. I mean, it looks very cute, but un unfortunately um, can be uh, carrying disease for us. Uh, then number two, chipmunks and shrews. So if this mouse, this little innocent, cute little mouse um, is infected, it can um, uh, infect 40 to 90% of the ticks that feed on it. And now those, it's sort of like how, how we're learning a lot about how COVID, you know, one, if you have one person shows up at a big party, then he's infecting all, all those people. So um, this one little mouse has a, a lot of power. Um, now, how this plays into um, uh, what, we're, what we want to bring into habitat uh, loss. Now, actually, the, the, the tick does prefers to go uh, feed on the larger um, mammals. So if there are more deer and cattle um, around, they will prefer to go feed on them and less so much the ticks. Um, but if all they have, I'm, I'm sorry, the mice, but if all they have available are the mice, they're gonna just feed on them and increase their chances to get infected. So this is where you kind of get the idea of a dilutional effect. The, the more um, diverse uh, of different types of hosts you have, and hopefully those would be the non-reservoir hosts, then you're kind of diluting the chance that a tick that may not have Lyme disease feeds on them and not get less chance that they, the tick gets Lyme disease and therefore less of a chance that if we get bitten by that tick that we get the Lyme disease. And then there's a lot of um, um, studies to back this up actually. Um, there's areas where, where there's a high Lyme disease transmission. Um, they find that there is a high density of reservoir hosts and low number of non-competent uh, or non-reservoir hosts. Um, and um, this is just a really quick, uh, I'm not really not going to go into it, but you're welcome to look at this later where they do show the dilutional effect. So the squirrel there, this is in, uh, in New York, the squirrel there exhibits a big dilutional effect um, for the prevalence of, of Lyme disease uh, or Lyme disease in the ticks. Um, so um, the idea that, you know, so once, you know, I see Lyme disease all the time in clinical practice and sort of look into like, where does this Lyme disease come from? And, and why is this happening? Uh, I come across these studies. And um, when you come across this dilutional effect, you think, well, you know, we should be supporting, 
more habitat conservation. So we have more diversity of, of species. Um, and there's studies that show that small forest fragments, um, the smaller the forest fragments are, the more the um, infection rates in, in ticks. So you, we want to preserve more larger forest fragments. And, um, and just to speak to some of the some of people I know kind of have some conspiracy, every disease has a conspiracy theory. Lyme disease also has one that was um, uh, developed in a lab. But when, well, there's one study that actually looked at the genome of the Lyme bacteria, and it's actually been around, the, the, the bacteria has been around for a long time. And um, it's not a recent invader. And in fact, um, nothing has happened to it that has made it more transmissible. There's no mutation, which really just points more that ecological changes that we are creating is giving this bacteria more opportunity to cause problems. So, um, you know, what, what is, I have here, epidemiologically meaningful? You know, I've done, I've done it too, the, the tick tubes. I think I got Lyme disease by actually putting in tick tubes on my property, um, getting rid of all the deer, mice traps, mice poison. Um, but this is just a sort of a, a, a catch up game. And when you really think about it and, and step back, it just makes sense to think about more land conservation that will support habitats that will sort of di dilute um, our exposure to, to Lyme disease. Um, that to me seems more meaningful. And, and I came, did come across one study that, you know, these short-sighted solutions where they, they did kind of eliminate a lot of these white-footed um, mice, they realized then they had, um, these mice were actually controlling the gypsy moth um, population and gypsy moths are destructive to eastern oak trees. So inadvertently decreasing the mice population was hurting the eastern oak trees. So that's why sort of just taking this holistic picture of um, kind of trusting the, the evolution of how habitats were created and just going back to that will kind of account for all the different things that we might, ha might have unintended consequences if we try to think of our own solutions. And this I always like to share with patients that we do have this free tick testing program in Pennsylvania. And they will tell you about a tick that you picked off if it has um, Lyme disease or not, and as well as these other tick-borne illnesses. And just so everybody knows that if you do pick off a tick off of you and pretty sure it's a deer tick and it's been within 72 hours, you can take a one dose of the, the antibiotic doxycycline that can decrease your chance that, that you will be, that the bacteria will invade more and cause problems. So always you can, you can call your, your doctor about that. So quickly moving on, um, I uh, gonna touch on West Nile virus. So West Nile virus, um, maybe not so much in the news, but it was, it was more and it's, it's still definitely around. Um, and um, I know I probably see this often in my office, you know, a typical patient um, comes in more in the, the summertime, fever, chills, muscle aches and headache, and you really don't know what it is and it kind of comes and goes, um, but you always kind of wonder, is it, West, wild, is it West Nile virus? And the only reason anybody, anybody would really know they were affected with West Nile virus if they were one of the ones that developed a severe illness and were hospitalized and they isolated the virus um, while they were hospitalized. But most times um, it's, it's, a, it's a mild illness for most people. Um, in our history, it's still relatively new as came in the US uh, in 1999. So this is a zoonotic disease again. It is um, a virus that's transported by mosquitoes and um, they get the, the, the disease from the birds and the mosquitoes are the vectors, birds are the reservoir and humans and horses are accidental dead end hosts. And um, this is just a, a diagram depicting that. Um, so same, same idea um, you have, if you bring um, the, the vector, to with its reservoir host and giving more of a chance to be together, you have more incidence of the virus and the disease. And um, so a lot of people think, 
uh, well, all I need to do is just get rid of uh, standing water during the wet, wet seasons. Um, but actually, counter it's a little bit counterintuitive where it's actually the drought conditions that um, creates a water seeking behavior of everybody, the, the, the vectors and the birds and the humans. And um, because they found this, that the hot spots um, are more have a, creating an association between dry summers and increased um, West Nile virus outbreaks um, in, a, in a bunch of studies done in the US. Um, and it's just sort of how what we've created um, in the in our new anthropogenic habitats, um, where we um, kind of just these these water sources. Um, everyone's going to the same water source in the same area, and now creating a great environment to exchange everything. Um, and sort of sort of on the flip end of that, they found that protected natural land areas where may have more. Um, natural water sources as opposed to just standing water, they had decreased um, uh, rates of West Nile virus. And there's this one study here where um, if you had uh, a, a small forest cover, you're four, four times more likely to have uh, incidents of the disease uh, than those that had uh, a good number of forest cover. And then there's also other studies that show it's, it's not just the idea of numbers, but also bird diversity um, also is associated with decreased West Nile virus in the vectors. Um, so again, it's not just, just the um, habitat to conserve the number of type of um, birds, but also if you increase the bird diversity, you're, you're helping that dilutional effect. Um, so, yeah. Um, so again, this just again goes back to land and habitat preservation decreases our may decrease our risk of having a, um, a contagion by West Nile virus, and you know it still helps to decrease your areas of standing water because that's more to prevent the larvae development of the mosquitoes and the number of mosquitoes. But that is that's not really the the answer. Um, so i um, just going to touch a little bit on this uh, COVID-19, which has taken over all our lives. And, um, you know, a typical patient may come in with cough and this loss of taste and smell is sort of pathognomonic, as we say, for COVID-19 today. Um, so, you know, there's so much on, there's more unknown than known. So um, I'm just going to sort of touch on some of the stuff I've just come across and um, maybe a, a takeaway from some of the literature that, that's out there about COVID and, and what does that have to do with environmental changes. Um, I, I'm very well aware there's a lot of conspiracy theories around the origins of COVID-19. Um, but there is some out there, again, that this is following the pattern of a typical zoonotic disease um, that is related to habitat loss and environmental changes that have increased our, our risk of getting the disease. So, you know, go, going back um, in the literature, bats are known reservoirs for, there's all these other types of corona, just this, this, this COVID-19 is one type of coronaviruses. And so bats are known to carry different types of coronaviruses. Um, to, as of today, there's no evidence that they have carrying this one that causes COVID-19. But um, so maybe a jump to assume that they carry this one too, but they carry all these types, a large number of coronaviruses. And um, these other studies have shown there's always been sort of this exchange between bats and humans um, and other animals um, before any kind of outbreaks happened. Um, and um, so this, 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 this zoonotic disease and how it's been exchanged between the different living things has always been there, but is it happening more? Why is it happening more? Could it be because of environmental changes? Um, so when they, um, they, there's many studies out there you can come across that show that the bats that live near places of human habitation have more, carry more coronaviruses, um, especially ones uh, in the, where they're clearing the 
uh, Amazon forest, they found that bats have a lot more um, disease prevalence than ones that were kept captured and tested for in pristine woodland. Um, there's also some evidence that the, the bats are just clustering by geographical lo location and not by um, just species pre um, preference, which is just sort of more support that um, changes in their environment are changing their behavior where they're hanging out. Um, and, um, you know, this these, these zoonotic diseases, we're, we're never going to be able to keep up with them at the, at the rate which we're, if, if what we're doing and changing the environments, it's, this is going to be a, a continuation. You know, these treatments and, and vaccines are afterthoughts and band-aids. And is there a way that we can have prevention that is ecologically meaningful for our, our you know, patients and the human population from getting sick? Because we always think in medicine, you know, it, you want to first prevent disease, not just just always treat it. Um, then, really quick, uh, this might be a little tangent from, um, you know, the change in habitats um, where it, our environmental toxicology. I'm just going to touch on this very quickly. Um, you know, obviously, environmental toxicology does impact our, our habitats and can destroy habitats. Um, but does it also play a role in how, how um, humans are um, reacting to the COVID-19? Um, why is it that one person, they have just the sniffles with COVID and then why someone has to be hospitalized and they sort of have the same, you know, their same age, sort of a mystery. So of course, when you have mysteries in medicine, you, you kind of go, your mind goes everywhere. And since I'm more, uh, have an environmental angle, you know, um, I do worry about the levels of to toxins in our systems and do our urban areas have more um, increased risk um, because they, have higher concentration of toxins and is obesity a risk because their um, toxins like to be stored in fat? Um, why, why are some people, the chronic diseases, development of um, diabetes and heart disease, yes, a lot of it has to do with diet, but there's sometimes a little bit more than that. And do toxins play a role in changing your genes to make you more susceptible to having risk factors? So, you know, you can come across multiple, all these typical um, toxins that we can find in our environment and in, in everything and everything that we use. Um, a lot of these toxins we talk about in, in, in the context of endocrine disruptors and cancer, but they actually um, have a lot of immune dysfunction. Um, and um, an immune dysfunction can um, be inherited. So there's this one study of dioxin that created immune dysfunction to flu A that they found that um, went on to the next generation, was inherited by the next generations of, of mice. And, and um, it's not just the immune system, immune system is in, intertwined with developing cardiovascular disease, diabetes and, and cancer, which then is what gives you a risk factor for, for COVID. And then the most important thing that I worry about is um, the, the COVID waste, I call it, that um, we, um, in our sort of knee-jerk short-term response, that we are just creating um, a lot more, uh, a lot of waste that right now it may be necessary, but um, it would be nice for the, our medical community to sort of think about um, as we get more comfortable with how to treat and diagnose this of, you know, how we can use, be more resourceful with the, the vials and swabs and gloves and gowns and face shields and take out food packaging and, you know, all this, how are we going to deal with this and its impact on our environment when, you know, we're on the other side of this pandemic. So um, that's um, pretty much with regard to my, my talk about tying in how where I came to connect uh, habitats and land conservation with these sort of run-of-the-mill disease thing processes that um, your run-of-the-mill doctor sees in the office around here. 
Um, but I really wanted to give just a few minutes um, to um, mental mental health and um, where how our environment um, plays into that. Because um, I have to say, being um, a practitioner that in, in whatever field you, you work in, that uh, anxiety and mental health is pretty much not number one um, in, in our patient population. And um, it comes, it's a, it's a very physical presentation, um, so much so that you may do this huge workup on somebody because you might have an inkling that it may be just anxiety causing their shortness of breath, but you don't know. So you have to do all these tests and, you know, after you, it's a process of elimination. So, you know, anxiety is very complex. Um, we forget how to breathe. We have different nervous systems. We're kind of thrown into this fight or flight. Um, I'm just bringing up on this slide of objective measures of how we can kind of determine where somebody may be at in their anxiety level with their heart rate and blood pressure. We can even use brain activity, the different brain waves um, to, to know where somebody is in their, um, their, their uh, alertness. Um, so just to give you that background as I go into talk about these different studies, of they're, they're, they're numerous, the, the studies of how looking at someone's brain waves, EEG data, so just looking at nature, exhibits relaxation. If you look at the fMRI brain scans, they show where urban scenes may sh show more activity in the areas of the brain that are linked to anxiety. Natural scenes um, are show activity in the brain that um, are associated with more relaxation. Multiple studies showing, you know, you have people looking at different scenes um, when they're hospitalized and, you know, needing less pain medication if they're looking at a natural uh, outside versus a brick wall. Um, and then, like I said, there's objective measures where they sort of looked at their blood pressures and heart rates to, to have some idea as opposed to just sort of um, more subjective response. Um, and that is more touching on, you know, what we presume, how, you know, we, we just kind of intu intuitively know um, looking at nature should make me feel more calm. Um, this is a known effect of it. Um, but I'm also wanting to bring to people's attention that um, maybe there's something about um, being in, an, in nature that does more than just this how we interpret, oh, I'm, I'm in nature, I'm relaxing, that there's some stimuli we're getting from being in a natural environment um, that is beyond our uh, ability to sense, um, that is having a positive effect on us. Um, so what I mean is the, the most uh, classic uh, example is that we know that me having natural light um, through my visual system uh, increases, um, uh, depresses melatonin. And melatonin is a substance that makes me sleepy. So the light going through my eyes is having this interaction with my brain um, that is doing something I'm completely unaware of, suppressing melatonin. So when it's dark, I increase melatonin, I can get sleepy. So the light is affecting my brain to do things to for my sleep-wake cycle. But, you know, I'm sure... I'm sure we are just at the, the tip of the iceberg to kind of know what effect nature being around in our, our natural habitats may be having. What if this, the smell of um, nature is going through my olfactory system in my brain and doing something to my immune system that I'm unaware of or touching um, uh, the soil, uh, maybe doing something beyond my awareness. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's this one study that was done in 2004 where this doctor was, um, to her lung cancer patients, was um, administering this um, bacterial serum to her patients to boost their immune systems. But she found that actually um, they overwhelmingly reported feeling happier and suffered from less pain than the controls that didn't receive the bacteria. 
And when they looked further, what this was is mycobacterium vacci, and it releases chemicals, um, that, uh, serotonin in the brain that's mood boosting. So all these are just, I think, tip of the iceberg to really know, you know, what if we restore ourselves more in our natural habitats and spend more time? Um, could we be enhancing our immune systems or doing things that we just don't even know that are aware of the benefits? Um, so that's sort of my little, my, my stretch there. Um, and um, my ultimate to bring it back to, um, you know, real life scenario is that, um, you know, in, in, in the doctor's office, we already talk about public health issues, sensitive issues, you know, gun safety, you know, something that may be political. Um, we do ask about prevention, things, diet, helmets, seat belts. Um, should, you know, providers, physicians take this opportunity if, if they have the time um, to talk about, you know, taking care of your property and pesticides, reducing use, eco products, if you can afford them. And even something else that is a concern of mine is the prescription medications that we prescribe. We always discuss the, the risks and adverse effects, but nobody really knows that you um, a lot of these medications you, met, you, you excrete in your urine or your feces unmetabolized and it goes into our, um, our water system and into the ground. Um, and that is also impacting our environment as well. Um, so um, outside the doctor's office, you know, um, sustainable land use. Um, if we think globally, but act locally, I think we can get a lot done. You know, um, my own experience being on my own township, um, getting to really understand land use zoning policies, um, trying to make changes on my own property. There's, a, there's so much to do um, uh, on my own property. Um, but again, I'm, you know, I'm grateful that I have people like and, and Lori and Howard EcoWorks and to advise me on how I can best and make my own property something sustainable. Um, and this was just a little slide um, that shows my own township, um, how we break, how the, the land use is um, broken down. And I am proud of my own township for really making efforts to preserve um, land and, and habitat. And I hope that uh, continues. So with that, um, I have references. If anybody wants to look um, further into something I mentioned, um, I uh, am going to stop sharing my um, screen here. And um, I guess I hope that was engaging for everybody and I'm ready for any questions if anybody has any. Thanks, Vita. That was excellent. Thank you. Great justification for what we're doing here at Howard EcoWorks to, to diversify our habitat and our ecosystems. So we're behind you 100%. <laughs> Thanks. Haven't gotten any questions yet in the uh, chat box. Um, I have a question, which is how common are the views that you have throughout the medical community? Are they, are you kind of a, an oddball or do you think that there is, are there others that are advocates for environmental protections and restorations the way you are? Um, I, um, you know, I may know a, a, a handful of my, my own colleagues who are like-minded. Um, I do, I, I was excited about a um, month ago, there was Institute of Medicine, uh, had a national conference on COVID-19 and um, climate change. And there was like a little chatter about, about having physicians involved because um, now, you know, it's, it's just in, in our face. Um, so I think that it's probably going to be more accepted. Um, and, um, you know, someone asked me, well, should I bring it up with my doctor when I see my doctor? Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to make a, a, my, my colleague's job any, any harder by, you know, we have to fit in so much in the short amount of time. You know, that's a whole different issue with our healthcare being, system being broken. Um, but hopefully, you know, this may be kind of more of a trickle down um, from the doctor's office to, to patients, but certainly patients coming up to doctors and, 
And um, having that as a conversation, I think that the change can come from that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly very logical and should provide a, a means for advocacy, I would think, to, to our local elected officials about conservation. Right, right. Um, let's see. Somebody asked, I think the question is, how did you engage your local community? I guess the so, students in New Charleston Township, how you are engaged with them. So um, it's it seems like um, when they're, I mean, we, we have our own, um, you know, uh, committee that does a lot of the, um, the zoning and uh, th those type of decisions, you know, we're more um, asked about our, our input on um, like after, um, after someone comes in and clears the land, you, you know, what, um, how they recommend re replanting thing, um, re uh, replanting and um, restoring. We're doing a lot of our riparian buffer re restoration around here um, and trying to educate um, property owners who have streams running through their property, um, reaching out to them. And we're hosting webinars as well um, and trying to engage um, residents. It, it might be a little easier in our township because I think a lot of people are here. Um, you know, we do end up paying, a, a, there's a little increment of the, the tax here that goes towards um, giving the township money to preserve um, bio properties and easements I mean, easements are very popular here um, but then um, but then to work with you know what if, if that's a big agricultural field as an easement like what what we can contribute to how to you know change the landscape there um, that's sort of that's the scope of what we do okay good um... Have you worked at all with veterinarians? Somebody recommends um, that approach. If ah, that's very interesting. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, um, a lot of kind of cross-pollination there. Right, right, right. That's a good suggestion, thank you. Um, somebody says, in my community, I always hear residents state concerns about inviting vermin that carry disease close to homes. Is there a balance that they, um, in terms of control, like um, vermin control? Yeah, I think that I think that is the I think that is the question about balancing controlling the um, vermin. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's yeah. You know, that's somebody that I sort of would kind of defer to um, what is exactly, wh why is your area attracting more vermins? Um, I don't know, is that-, is that Oh, okay, is here's that a clarification. Oh. She is about um, that if we are building these kind of habitat friendly landscapes, those will attract more wildlife that bring vermin, that bring the diseases. I guess it depends. I mean, I, maybe I would defer to you, Lori, in terms of creating, how would you, I mean, I sort of picture of looking at a, the, the specific zone that you're in and, you know, maybe it's, there might, might be differing opinions on what the, the natural habitats that was there previously, how close you can get to it and what that looks like so that you bring the balance that may have been there before. Because I, I sort of just put faith in that whatever evolved that was there evolved in the balance. Um, and that's my big premise. If that premise is wrong, that's that's something else. But if I if I would bring somebody who would have more of an idea of how to restore that natural habitat and that, that balance that comes with it, I would think that that might address any kind of overpopulation of, of one mm -hmm. problem. I mean, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think in having a diverse a diversity in your landscape, as you described, that creates a diversity of species that are going to control each other. Um, have you heard about the barberry, um, the invasive barberry, and how the white-footed mice like to congregate under them because they have more humid envir environments? 
and that species is just going crazy in our forested landscapes and it's you know one of the reasonings for the increase in Lyme disease is associated with that particular species but I know, yeah. I haven't heard it specifically but yeah that makes that makes sense yeah yeah but um let's see So I think the rest are just some comments. Um, excellent suggestions for health providers to include environmental health information during office visits. Yeah, somebody agrees with you there. <laughs> That's so. nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if nobody has any more questions this evening, um, we can wrap it up. Thank you, Vita, for your time tonight and for sharing all of your wealth of information. It's great perspective uh, for all of us and very, very timely now with um, the coronavirus. So it's good to bring attention to it and the need for habitat conservation and restoration now more than ever. Yep. Yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate everyone's time. And um, if anybody, I guess you can help facilitate if anybody has any specific questions I'm happy to answer them yeah and do you want us to or do you want to put your email in the chat or any contact information or we can share it out later uh, with your presentation also okay yeah um sure yeah you can just post my um contact okay presentation okay so we'll follow up with everybody um via email we'll share the presentation and, a con and contact information if you have any additional questions and look for the posting of this video on our website and hopefully it goes published on our Facebook page as well. So have a good night, everybody. Thank you for letting me host. Thank you. Uh, all right, thanks Vita. I mean, Dr. Manny. <laughs> I'm Vita. <laughs> um,